Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a uh, interesting subject this morning. Um, those of us who are, are parents and uh, grandparents know that uh, children uh, or little kids learn very early in life how to get one over on their uh, on their parents through sneakiness. I mean, uh, even babies as young as uh, six months know all about getting mum's attention by what I'd call uh, fake crying. Uh, my little granddaughter, Alita, who's, uh, who's nearly two, you know, when I go and visit them, she might initially come to me for a hug and uh, uh, when I immediately mum grabs her, gives her a cuddle, and then suddenly she's all smiles. You know, so uh, clearly uh, she knows how to get attention very quickly. Um, and little babies do. You know, they know that if they cry really loudly, mummy will come running really fast. So, uh, sorry parents, it's all downhill for after that. <laughs> anyway, look, Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 tells us that uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yeah, and one of the really um, subtle things about human nature or our hearts, as that verse tells us, is that how skilled we get at making excuses uh, when we don't really want to do things. In other words, they're just dressed up lies. Um, sometimes they call us uh, white lies. Um, and, and I guess what's prompted me to give this talk is, uh, is all the pathetic excuses that uh, we've had from our so-called political leaders during the pandemic as to, as to why we've got to go into uh, lockdown. And uh, you know, it prompted me to talk about this aspect of, uh, of human nature. So why do we do it? Why do we rely upon uh, excuses rather than actual reasons? I mean, a reason is what we offer when we're unable to do something. That's fair enough. An excuse is what we offer when we don't really want to do something and hope to get out of it. And we all know an excuse when we hear one, don't we? You know, we might smile and we might nod, but we know that it's not really true and it's actually a lie. Um, you know, I did a bit of uh, research on the web, which is where you find everything, <laughs> of course, and it's all true. Um, and uh, the most common excuses are, and, and everyone knows this, the dog ate my homework, you know. I, I think that's an urban myth because I don't think any dog anywhere has ate anyone's homework. Um, and when explaining why they're late for a meeting, you know, people give excuses like, uh, oh, the traffic was bad, my alarm clock didn't go off, or I wasn't feeling well. Uh, and maybe e explaining when they were, uh, you know, uh, not going to come in, they're calling in sick to work. Uh, they'll say things like, oh, my, nan my nana died, you know, for the sixth time. Um, or I have food poisoning. Or I don't want to hurt your feelings, you know, or uh, the check is in the mail. Um, or the one that I like, which is when explaining to a policeman why they were speeding, you know, my fuel light was flashing, so I was rushing to a service station to fill up. Yeah, right, you know. Um, in relationships, common excuses are, uh, I'll be ready in a minute. Uh, or I'll do it in a minute, or of course I'm listening. Um, and men, what, what do you say when your wife or your, or your girlfriend asks you, do I look fat in this outfit? I'll leave it to you to contemplate what you're going to say to that. Either way, you'll get into trouble, trust me. I mean, if you Google the word lying, it comes up with some interesting statistics. Some studies would suggest that on average, people lie at least once a day and are lied to by many others many times a day. A figure of uh, 60 or 50 was mentioned. They must have been referring to, uh, to other people, not good revival fellowship people. Is that right? Absolutely. We don't tell fibs. Um, the reality is, though, a lie is a lie, and God hates them all. Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19 says, These, see, these six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord amongst the brethren. It's interesting that, uh, that lying and, and deception are so prominent in that list. Um, you know, and probably one of the most amazing excuses in scripture uh, was told by Moses' brother, Aaron, um, who was left in charge when Moses went up to, uh, to Mount Sinai. Uh, to get the Ten Commandments from God. When Moses delayed his return, the, the Israelites got uh, restless and wanted other gods to worship. 
and uh, in Exodus 32 and verse 1, and it says, When the people saw that Moses delayed and came down of the, from the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not or we don't know uh, what is become of him. So instead of showing leadership um, and refusing their demands, what Aaron did was he gave in and told them to bring all their gold earrings and he melted them down and he made a golden calf, which the people all worshipped. And uh, while this was all happening at, uh, up on Mount Sinai, God tells Moses that the people have uh, corrupted themselves and, uh, and tells him to get back to them quickly. So when Moses uh, uh, returns, he finds the people have gone absolutely crazy. They're behaving you know, like uh, they're in a drunken party. And he, and he questions Moses, uh, he, sorry, he questions Aaron, uh, what has happened? And in Exodus 32 and verse 24, Aaron says, And I said to him, Whatso Whosoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. Then I cast it in the fire, and there came out this calf. Yeah, so somehow this golden calf just popped out of the fire when he threw the gold in. You know, what, was he serious? I mean, that's a total lie. Incredibly lame excuse. And uh, they very narrowly missed out on being destroyed by the Lord at that time. It's a really quite serious uh, breakdown in uh, both leadership and, and the people. So that, that was just the introductions, okay? Um, we now come to the real story I wanted to cover this morning. Um, and it's a parable about the generosity of a king and uh, the pathetic excuses of those who uh, refused and abused his, uh, his kindness. It's also a parable about the kingdom of heaven. You know, God is the king and Jesus is son, uh, his marriage to the church and the reception feast that uh, is after it. You know, God's spirit-filled people, that's you and I, we're the church. Uh, God's invitation offers us salvation and blessings to those who accept his call and uh, negative consequences to those who reject it. You know, it's covered in, uh, in Matthew 22. We're going to have a look at it this morning and also in, in Luke chapter 14 with a few distances, uh, differences. You know, I believe um, they're essentially the same story from different perspectives. Um, if you read them both together, I think it, it helps get a bit of an understanding as to what I'm going to talk about this morning. So let's, let's start off in Matthew 22, verses 2 to 5, and just go through it. The kingdom, oh, so I'll read it out, so just to make it a bit easier. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, behold, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went, up, went their ways, one to his farm, another to merchandise. So we'll just stop there for now. Um, you know, there are many aspects to this parable, and uh, no doubt you could give a number of talks about it. But I just wanted to focus particularly, seeing as we're talking about excuses today, um, about why people refuse God's salvation message. Um, I mean, here in Matthew, it's talking about a royal wedding feast for the king's son. In Luke 14, where we look at also, it's called a great supper made by a certain man. You know, my Bible links the two stories uh, in, the, in its concordance, so I believe it's reasonable to say they're essentially uh, two descriptions of the same event. Luke gives a little bit more detail on um, what the specific excuses are, so if, you, um, if you've got your Bibles there, you can, uh, you can follow through uh, with me. <clears throat> so in Matthew 22, to be invited to a, uh, a royal wedding feast, I mean, that would have been a great honour. Um, it's just like if, if you or I had been invited to, uh, to Harry and Megan's um, wedding and the reception afterwards. It was a big deal. You know, those sort of celebrations would have gone on for weeks, you know, with guests staying at the, uh, the palace. There would have been no um, uh, expense spared. You know, the best chefs, the, uh, the decorators, musicians, food and wine and so on and offer. You know, and, the, and the protocol back then was that there were two invitations set out. The first one was ask the guests to RSVP, just like you would now if you're inviting someone to your wedding. Um, and if you're unable or unwilling to go, well, that's when you said thanks, but no thanks. Fine. Um, the second one was essentially saying, after you'd accepted the first, all is now ready, please come. We're ready to go. As the story unfolds in, in both uh, Matthew and Luke, um, we can see people making excuses, uh, one after the other, 
rejecting the second invite um, after they've already accepted the first. You know, they'd already been bidden. Um, that would have been incredibly rude to the, uh, to the host, as you can imagine. In fact, it was worse than that. They treated it as a joke, as it says in Matthew 22 and verse 5. They made light of it. One went to his farm, another to his merchandise. You know, that speaks of them really not caring at all um, and instead giving lame excuses for attending. I mean, it's incredibly rude. Um, so over in Luke 14 now, um, as I said, it's essentially the same story with some variations. We get a little bit more detail about what those, um, those excuses were. And, and these people, remember, would have known, you know, that it was the king or a great man that was uh, how much money and effort had gone into the preparation um, by the host. And as I said, they'd already accepted the first invitation. So, you know, why were they necessarily now saying they couldn't go? I mean, how insulting it would have been to simply turn down the host, you know, after all the effort that had been done. Um, and essentially, as we said, there were three excuses that are, that are given. And the first two relate to property and, and, and career or, or work issues. And the third relates to relationships. And it's interesting because um, this parable is all about the kingdom of heaven and, uh, and responding to God's call. And it's typically those three areas, relationships, uh, possessions, and, and work issues, which people use as excuses to say why they can't come along to our fellowship or they, they can't follow the Lord. They can't respond to his invitation for salvation. So let's have a look at them in a bit more detail. Luke 14, verses 18 to 20. So excuse number one, this is about possessions being more important than God. So it says in verse 18, I've bought a piece of land and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Who buys a block of land or property without checking it out first? I mean, this guy must have been a real deal, you would think. We all know the euphemisms that uh, real estate agents use, don't we? I mean, they're just really lies designed to suck us in, aren't they? Things like sea views. Well, maybe if you've got a super powerful telescope, you can maybe just see a bit of water off in the distance, hundreds of miles away. Or a cosy cottage means no bigger than a phone booth. Um, or renovator's delight means it's a broken down dump. I mean, we all know, we all smile and we know those things. The reality is any buyer of a land or property would have had ample opportunity to examine it before buying it. You know, it, this guy, it's just a flimsy lie. He was allowing his possessions to prevent him responding to God's invitation. And that's really pathetic. Excuse number two, this is about career being more important than the Lord. Verse 19 says, another said, I've bought five yoke, that's 10 oxen. And I go to prove them. I pray have, the, have me excused. I mean, another weak excuse. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't you check out 10 oxen if you were going to buy them first? I mean, what if they were sick or diseased? I mean, would you buy a car without test driving it first? Of course you wouldn't. I mean, oxen back then were used for ploughing a field. So essentially they were income generators. So maybe this guy was a farmer. So that was his, uh, that was his job, his career. Um, so supposedly here, this man's career was, helping, was preventing him from accepting the Lord's invitation. I mean, look, there's nothing wrong with a career. We all need one to put food on our tables and, and support our families, don't we? Um, godly people are in fact the most trustworthy, conscientious and hardworking people that you could possibly find, regardless of whatever job they might have. You know, scripture exhorts us to do all as we do, you know, as under the Lord. So they're, they're fantastic workers. This is not what this is about. This is about priority and balance in our lives. You know, when our job or our career is more important to us than our relationship with God, then something is wrong. And our priorities are out of step if this is the case. Amen. Amen. Excuse number three, relationships are more important than God. Verse 20 tells us, and another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. You know, he could have brought his wife um, to the, to the wedding feast. And I no doubt she would have jumped at the chance, not having to, uh, uh, you know, cook herself. Um, again, it was nothing more than a flimsy excuse and highly offensive to the king. You know, so summarizing, the first excuse was bound up, the man was bound up in his possessions. 
The second in his career and the third allowed his natural relationships to prevent him from coming. You know, just on relationships, you know, there's nothing more virtuous than the love of a husband for his wife. You know, I mean, Jesus himself used that uh, analogy in comparing his love for the church. Um, you know, jo Jesus created men and women and, uh, and the institution of marriage, and he blesses it. And that union is, is, can be a wonderful thing. As I said, we're 45 years now, and I've had a wonderful time. That's nice, isn't it? <laughs> I want a few brownie points there. <laughs> You know, despite what our society says, and they, they, they do tend to denigrate uh, the institution of marriage today, sadly. Um, this wasn't about that. Rather, this was simply using this as an, as a, as an excuse to, to turn away from God. You know, things haven't changed much today, have they? You know, some, some of us still offer flimsy excuses as to why we might not be able to get to a meeting or to pray or to read the word of God. You know, things like I'm, I'm too tired, I'm too cold, you know, it's too wet to go out, I'm too busy, life is so hectic, I just don't have time. You know, the Bible is so hard to read. If it is so hard to read, get one of the many translations that are in modern English. You know, the New Living Translation I find to be excellent. Um, I mean, if you were to compare those ex sort of excuses with the lengths that some sports fans go, um, you know, in supporting their fav favourite teams, you know, just, we just had the, uh, the state of origin uh, football matches on, you know, they don't care what, uh, what the weather's like, you know, they, they dress up in the favourite colours, um, you know, they'll, they'll even camp out in the stadium, outside the stadium in, their, in freezing cold weather in order to make sure they're going to get the best seats. <clears throat> when a home goal is, served, is scored, you know, they go wild with excitement and with passion. They even have amazing memories uh, of previous game scores and statistics. <clears throat> Uh, that go back years, you know? What if people were as passionate about uh, their relationship with God, you know, never missing an opportunity to worship the Lord or to attend a meeting, you know? I mean, I'd love it if people camped outside, you know, before the meetings, you know, in order to get the best seats. Probably not going to happen, though. <laughs> um, amen? Imagine if your doctor said to you, um, you know, God forbid, you only have two weeks to live. Um, do you think your busy schedule might suddenly be freed up? Um, of course it would. You know, we all focus on what we think is important in our lives, don't we? And, and if we're staring imminent death in two weeks um, in, in the face, I mean, we'd all want God's grace. We'd all want his peace. And we'd all want his comfort in the days ahead, wouldn't we? You know, absolutely we would. You know, many find... Many of us find time each day to, you know, to read the newspaper, to check our emails and texts and update Facebook or surf the web for hours. Yet we say we don't have time to open our Bibles or pray. You know, let's not fall into that excuse trap, folks, um, and commit to allocate some quality time to the Lord every single day. You know, what's, that's what's important in life, you know, our relationship with God. You know, in Matthew um, 6 and verses 19 to 20, it tells, says to us, Lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break in nor steal. A little bit further on in that uh, chapter 6, um, it says, uh, after telling us not to worry about our basic needs, you know, for food and shelter and so on, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God in verse 33 and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So all of our basic necessities of life, our needs, God will provide them for you. It's some fantastic advice. So let's not worry about whether our house or our bank account is, is big enough. Leave that in the Lord's hands. You know? God knows what we need, so why not seek him? And he'll provide those needs. And by the way, God supplies our needs not necessarily our wants. So it's no good praying that the Lord, you know, give us a Lamborghini or something like that. That's just crazy. He provides what our needs are. You know, it may be counterintuitive, but uh, spending uh, time seeking the Lord each day will actually give you more time to do the things that you, you know, may need to do during that day. You know, instead of chasing your tail and getting all stressed, you know, and losing you know, sort of track of where you're at. You know, I find when I, spend time in the mornings seeking the Lord, 
you know, he gives me that peace. He gives me that assurance. It just helps to, you know, focus your mind. And then the day seems to go wonderfully well. Praise the Lord. You know, try it. You'll find it's the same also. Uh, and your spiritual life will benefit immensely by regularly seeking the Lord each and every day. You know, maybe even before you even get up. First things first, you know, let's have a time of prayer with, your, with, with the Lord. You might say to your, your partner. <clears throat> In Luke uh, 14 and verses 26 to 27, which is after that uh, parable that we've just been talking about, it says there, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be dis my disciple. Wow. Those are really strong words. Really strong words. How can that be? When you look at those scriptures, you know, when, when things, uh, scriptures like Ephesians chapter 5, where it says, husbands love your wives as Jesus loved the church. And in Titus chapter 2, it says, young women love your husbands and children. We're even told to love our enemies. So how can we reconcile that with what that verse is saying to us there? What does it all mean? It's a matter of priority. A matter of priority. It means that we are to love God more than all of our natural relationships. That's what it means. In fact, compared to our love of God, you know, all our natural relationships are so far down the list that it would almost seem like hatred by comparison. That's because the gulf is so great. You know, the reality is, if we really love God as we ought, then we're going to have more love for our spouse, more love for our children, for our family, and etc. everything else. It's saying, let's get our priorities in order first. God number one in our life. That's the most important. And everything else flows from that. The word disciple, you know, comes from a root word for discipline. Now, you know, when you... When people talk about discipline, they cringe a bit because it, it sounds like really hard work. In reality, it's making time for what's important in life. And that's God himself. You know, in contrast for all of the excuses that we may come up with from time to time. True disciples prioritize God in their lives and make time for prayer, for reading the word, and for fellowshipping with the brothers and sisters, the brethren. So important. You know, the antidote for, for pathetic, weak excuses that we might come up with from time to time is to keep Jesus in the center of our relationships. Keep Jesus in the center of our life. Amen? And by the way, taking up your cross daily is sacrificing our needs to serve the Lord. Putting him number one. The rewards are fantastic. You know, real spiritual growth and blessings from God. Amen? Amen. You know, the final part of this um, parable is only mentioned in Matthew 22 and verses uh, uh, 11 to 14. And it describes the man who, who didn't have on a wedding garment. So verse 11 there, it says, And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how camest thou thither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of, of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. You know, if we were invited to a, um, a royal wedding reception, you know, having the right clothes on, that'd be a big deal, wouldn't it? I mean, you'd want to fit in, wouldn't you? You want to get it right. And the custom at that time was that the host would hand out clothes at the door. So there was never any concern, you know, all the guests put on those clothes and they, they all fitted in. So this man was either a gate crasher or he refused to accept the king's clothes. So that would have been a huge offence to the king. And he would have stuck out like a sore thumb, this fellow. So getting back to the spiritual meaning, you know, that underlines this parable. You know, the man had essentially rejected God's free offer of the garments of salvation, you know. What does that mean? Well, in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10, it says, I will re greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, 
for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has clothed, covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. The garment of salvation, you know, the robe of righteousness are spiritually what God gives us when we receive the Holy Spirit. It's the seal on our salvation contract with God. You know, the man without the right clothes. You know, I, I believe he represents, you know, those who say, I'll get to heaven on my own terms, thanks very much. You know, or, or on my own good works. I don't need God to do anything for me. You know, that's self-righteousness, isn't it? You know, which is irrelevant as far as God is concerned. You know, the Bible says that salvation is only available through God's grace and receiving the Holy Spirit. You know, to claim it somehow by, uh, you know, living a good life according to your own self-assessment, and that's important, is sufficient for salvation, is effectively saying, you know, the death of Jesus on the cross was a waste of time. It was unnecessary. If that were true, then why would God have gone through that awful pain of separation from Jesus when he took upon himself the sin of mankind on that cross. You know, it's horrendous. It wouldn't have happened. Only Jesus can clothe us, clothe us with his righteousness. Amen? You know, our own righteousness, as it says in Isaiah 64 there, is as filthy rags, you know, by comparison. In Revelations 19 and verses 7 to 9, it says, um, let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the lamb, that's Jesus, um, is come and his wife, i.e. the church, has made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. You know, that's a, a wonderful depiction of Jesus Christ as the lamb of God marrying his bride, the church. That's you and I. You know, Acts 4 and verse 12 tells us that there is salvation only in Jesus and there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And in Romans 8 and verse 9, it also says, now if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So it's pretty clear that salvation is only available through Jesus' sacrifice and free gift to the Holy Spirit. Nothing else. We can't earn it and we can't get it on our own terms. Only through Jesus. You know, so when the man con was confronted by the king in verse, uh, 20, verse 12 there, it says he was speechless. He had no excuses. You know, and his fate was to be cast into outer darkness. You know, that's not a good outcome, is it? Awful. We don't want to be in that situation. So too will anyone else that seeks to earn their salvation. You can't do it. It won't work. So... I just wanted to, as I said today, talk about, um, you know, excuses. We had a bit of a laugh there and, it, and it's good fun. But, but maybe we just need to think about if we're offering excuse for something we don't really want to do, just to be truthful. You know, let's be honest with ourselves and, uh, and change our, uh, our behaviour and attitude if we need to. I mean, look, Jesus is our model, isn't he? Not man, not his uh, sort of way of doing things, which we know is wrong. And, uh, and the final thing I wanted to just reiterate is that um, we can only get it to heaven. We can only get our salvation, you know, on that great day by being clothed in that wedding garment, that robe of righteousness, you know, which represents salvation, only given to us by Jesus through his precious gift of grace and uh, forgiveness. Amen? Yeah. You know, don't even think about trying to get into heaven outside of that way that's laid down in the scriptures. I'll leave it there. Amen. And back to Lloyd, you're uh, going to run us through. Uh